What is going on everyone? Tutorial Tim here at Design Academy and today we're going to be going over data tables. Um, this is a, a newer component in Material Design's documentation and in their library. So we're going to overview what data tables are and the usage and then we're going to go ahead and build out some tables starting by, by building out the modular elements of a table which you'll know uh, how to do after we go through this documentation. So if we open up that link here, you'll notice that tables display sets of data across rows and columns, and we have an interactive demo, and there's two options. We have a generic data table, right, where it's a selective based upon the row format, and then we also have, it, so this could be considered the default data table, for example. And in this interactive demo, we have the example of another variant of the data table where it is uh, it utilizes checkboxes in each row, even the row with a header, which implies selecting all rows. Or you could individually go about selecting these items, which is fantastic. And we can start to talk about the usage behind this and the usage entails uh, of course, displaying information in a grid-like format of rows and columns, and they can organize information in a way that's easy to scan so that users can look for patterns and develop insights from that data. And these data tables can contain interactive components, which, are, which include chips, buttons, or menus, and also non-interactive elements such as badges. And uh, within these tables as well, uh, these data tables, tools to query and manipulate data. So more often than not, these tools to manipulate and, and query the data are these, these set, the set of functionality, as you can see in the, this anatomic breakdown, this anatomy breakdown, um, uh, the rows per page, uh, accessing that and maneuvering between pages of this data that is filtered in this row format or column format, depending on how we design it, and we'll do, do both variants. And here you can see that you could sort it with this by clicking on this action here in the header. Uh, and you can schedule the time in either ascending or descending order, I'm assuming. Uh, but we don't exactly know that functionality. But that is typically a, a common use case for tables to sort in ascending and descending order based off of what the, the uh, header indicates, which will imply the type of functionality that will be either ascending or descending. And then we have here uh, the the breakdown of it, of course. So in this breakdown, we have the header row, and then we have our our entirety of the rows within below the header row. Um, and so you could think of those as the rows as the children of the header row. Um, and we have the pagination here, uh, this pagination row right here, all along, or majority of the functionality is on the right side of this. And then we have the uh, row checkbox. Uh, which is specified here. So these individual checkboxes <clears throat> per row, including the header. And we have our sort button here to sort these elements. And then we have our container. And here you can see examples of interactive elements, um, which include the pagination here to navigate through. We also have these icons in this example that communicate alerts uh, dependent upon the table type. Uh, and then sorting columns and whatnot. And then it starts to, after the anatomy in this documentation, it breaks down uh, the specs on how to build this component. And uh, in my opinion, this wasn't a necessarily a great breakdown of how to really create this component from scratch, but it shows you what you can utilize. So for example, there's sorting with a progress indicator. There's also the, the uh, selection the multiple selections within the row or the or making an entire selection and the hover state. Um, there's many things here offered, uh, which is great. So we'll go ahead and check out these specs. I highly recommend you going through this. A lot of great information here on how to uh, understand how to utilize data tables and not only that, how to mix and match certain things that are appropriate in regards to usage. And with that specified, um, there's no elevation being utilized on data tables. They do not express elevation as they're often in front of solid color backgrounds and they do not move in front of or behind other surfaces, um, which is why there's no elevation being utilized. So now we can go ahead and jump into our Figma file. And here in our data tables, I have specified what our tables are gonna be composed of. So I'm calling them cells. Our data table will be composed of cells that will 
then group together. And based off of all these screenshots in this exercise file, I've, I've went ahead and uh, built out the majority of the cells that we'll need. So we'll need a cell that contains a checkbox, as you can see here. This, we'll need that type of main component to utilize. And then we'll need a cell that indicates a header. And on top of that, we also need a cell that indicates a number. Um, as you can see in this, in this example right here, we have these numbers and they're right aligned. That is a principle we'll utilize and specify in that cell. And then we have our text cell, which is a, the, the most commonly used cell here, as you can see. And then we have some parameters around spacing and, in reg and also specifying the height of these elements as well. So you can see that the header cell is set to 56, or at least we could set the height to 56 for these cells. Um, and also, or we could set them to uh, apply the proper constraints so that way designers can then utilize those instances and modify them accordingly with the proper alignment of the icon in that cell, which would work so we could specify one size and then just increase that size in the instance and as long as it's constrained vertically and horizontally, center, which would work in our case uh, for the checkbox. And you can see some other things around padding as well. So this is all built in a 40 by 40 frame here. So we can go ahead and start off with the, the uh, checkbox cell. If we ensure that we enable our material design system library, uh, and then I can go ahead and look for my type in checkbox as needed. So if I go ahead and type in check, we have the, it's actually labeled unselected, excuse me. We have that there. And what I can go ahead and do, I'm gonna remove those constraints and ensure that I wrap this in a frame. And with that wrapped in a frame, I'm gonna go ahead and make sure this is set to center, both horizontally and vertically. And then with the parent frame selected, I'm gonna set that frame uh, to 40 by 40 dips. So. Uh, we are good to go. That checkbox is now center, and I'm not going to apply a a fill color because I will not need that for the from the get go. Uh, this is important because um, we'll be depending on the background color of the parent the container, which we'll get to later once we create these cells. So I'm going to label this cell slash forward slash uh, checkbox. So we now have our checkbox variant. And with this checkbox variant created, I could even go ahead and just create this as a as a main component. And with that, we can go ahead and create this the next cell. So one thing that's important to specify here is understanding spacing, right? So the spacing will actually allow us to define the the size of our cell. So what we need to do is go ahead and you, you see. The, in this example, we have a padding of 16 on the left between this checkbox and the body copy on the right, and then a padding of 32 on any other columns to follow. And that principle applies in each column as, we, as it moves forward. So 16 dip padding on the left and right side of each header name, meaning that it will be 32 two in general between each uh, column. So now that we have that principle justified, what we can go ahead and do is um, by creating this, this, this text box, uh, you, let's just create that text box and apply the proper constraint. So I'm gonna have this frame here and I'm gonna set the height to 52 on this frame because and add no fill apply text property and set that to say online Add the proper fill color, set that to text and iconography, medium emphasis, or actually active, high emphasis. And then the color style, text style to uh, body one, make sure that text is selected. I didn't select my text, so I have to reapply the color style there. Whoops, set that to high emphasis and the body style to body one. And now that that is specified, I'm gonna go ahead and go to my type details and set the resizing to auto width. And then what I wanna do is uh, vertically center this within the frame. 
and then I could even align this to the left or I could set this uh, 16 dips to the right of, of the parent frame here. As you can see, 16 dips to the right. And I could go ahead and apply that same principle to, to the right of this cell. So I'm gonna go ahead and actually uh, horizontally align this by holding down Option H. And what I'm gonna do is hit Shift A, and then I'm gonna, which creates auto layout, and I'm gonna re remove the horizontal padding and vertical padding, which is set to uh, one and one by defaults. And then you have to recenter your element, uh, which is annoying. And then I'm going to make this frame uh, I'm going to label it cell forward slash text and then I'm going to add auto layout to this frame as well and then what I've done here is I've now implemented auto layout so the spacing on the left and right will maintain right now it's set to 56 on the left and right and I can modify that here and set that to 16 because why are we setting this to 16 on the left and right well we're setting it to 16 because based off the documentation and it clearly indicates that there are 16 dips of padding on the left and right side of each header name. So whenever we duplicate this, there will always be that 16 dip padding. And that we'll see that once we build out our, our first data table, which is awesome. And again, no fill here. Uh, proper constraints are applied in this regard. So I can go ahead and uh, what I'm gonna do is uh, duplicate this and then I'm gonna make this a main component and the same principles will apply to creating a, a header variant. And for our header variant, we're gonna need to all be able to justify what that text style is going to be because it is now, we're using a bold variant, right? So we have this, it, it could be a subtitle, but I would imagine that it's actually much bolder. And one thing that was hard for me to depict in the system is that it looks like it utilizes an H6 for the headers as it's slightly bigger. Um, and we can go ahead and check the documentation again under, under data tables on Material Design's website and under theming, typically in general, the theming specifies the uh, body style. But here, data tables uh, utilize the size uh, 14 for this theme, which is a material design theme, but a variant of material design, which is called Rally. Um, I use the body two, but in our context for material design uses the body one. And we here also show cases to you uh, colors being util utilized. And what we're gonna do is we, we're trying to justify what what style to utilize for a header. And it seems that we've been able to define that closely where it's using this uh, H6 uh, text style here in our system headers H6. So we're gonna stick with that cell and that has auto layout applied to already by default because we duplicated it. So all we need to do is name this cell header, uh, cell header, or you can name it, you could be more clear and concise or header text if you'd like, uh, whatever is best for you and your team or organization. Um, as I'm sure there are better principles to apply there, but we are building this uh, for the sake of understanding how to build out components. And then with that said, we, we have, let's check, we need to create a number cell now. So we've created our checkbox, our text variant and our header variant. So now, Whoops, we need to create our number cell, my apologies. So with the number cell, what we're gonna be doing with the number cell is ensuring that the there is ample amount of space and what we want our numbers to align to the right. So how do you justify that in a cell since you haven't completely composed the table? Well, that's something we're gonna tackle right now. Because here you can see that it right aligns and we will have to assume that this, this element will right align and then we have to define the width of this cell. So let's figure that out. So we can go ahead and duplicate this text variant and I'm gonna detach the instance and label it and rename it cell number. 
And what we can do within this is if I hold Option D down, or let's see, if I, since auto layout's applied to it, it is, I can't rearrange the elements. So I'm gonna detach the auto layout by holding Option Shift A, which turns it into a frame. And then I'm gonna hit Command Shift G to remove that frame because we don't need it. And what we need to do is set the, uh, the properties here to align right. So you'll notice a slight shift, right? So I'm undoing it. I just, you see that text alignment change went from left aligned to right aligned. So we want right alignment because that is what's indicated in the spec here, right align numbers. And what we're gonna go ahead and do is just throw some numbers in here as an example, zero three, uh, zero three, uh, whatever, 43, 0, 03, 43, okay, magic numbers. And with that right alignment, uh, you'll notice that it is still dynamic because of auto layout, so we might not actually want to do that. We'll see, what we'll need to do is maybe just adjust the, the cell to where the element, there is no padding on the right side of this cell so you may not actually need auto layout. It would just stay like this. So every time you would type, it would keep, it would, it would truncate if it uh, leaked the outer bounds of the cell. So in this regard, we're gonna keep it as a frame for this number and ensure that it snaps to the right of this frame and is centered vertically and the height is appropriately set. And then I'm gonna add constraints here and set this to center and right. So that way when it stretches, it is still aligned to the right of the parent container. So I'm gonna make that a main component. And now we're ready to go. We can go ahead and actually build out an entire table. And I'm gonna go ahead and hop onto Material Design's website and we're gonna just reference this table here. We have an entire table built out and it has full five rows. One of the rows being a, a, a header excuse me, and all I have to do, because I'm using all these elements, is I'm selecting them all, just holding down Option and dragging them. Now I have the instances, and what we wanna do is just create a row, essentially. So with this created, we have this, if I zoom out on Material Design's website, I could actually just kind of, I could build, this is a much quicker table to build, which we should build, um, it'll be a good, a test for us to build and what we need is a parent container right and this parent container is going to be composed of rows so if I go ahead and grab this here I'm going to label this data table uh, with checkbox checkboxes uh, there we go so what we're going to do is apply the background uh, a color of surface is surface and the corner radius is set to four and then it utilizes a stroke of one dip inside and we're going to set that to surfaces surface overlay so now you can start to see that outline there and with that said we could even go ahead and just drop this in so what we're going to do with this checkbox, now that we've dropped it in, we know that the height of headers is set to, it's set to 56 as specified here, 56 and 52 for rows. So with that said, we're gonna go ahead and actually wrap this into a frame. So I'm gonna label this, so I have it wrapped in a frame now. I'm gonna label it row one, uh, header, header. And then all we have to do is set the, the height to 56. And before I do that, I'm gonna make sure the constraints are set to left and center so that this will stay center within the parent container once I change that height. So now I've set the height to 56, and then I'm gonna snap that to the top using option W and snap it to the left using option A. But I'm gonna make sure the width of this, we need to define the width of this. So we have, it's set to 40 currently, but our touch target's 48. And then our, with our touch target being 48, let's see, let's do the math. So we have this set to 40 by 40 in our screenshots. 
And then if we have the 45 by 40, and then it's on the left, it's set to 48. So we have spacing of padding of 48 dips on the left. So with that, I can go ahead and select this. And again, this is the entire row. So we're actually trying to just align the, the checkbox here. So if we select that element here, this checkbox, I can snap this, push it over. Now it's eight dips to the left. So that's great. And then we can specify this to span the entire row because this is the row container. And with that specified, we now have the proper spacing for our checkbox in our header. And then all I have to do is grab, whoops, sorry, Figma kind of crashed there or something funky happened. Long story short, now we have this header variant. And with this header variant, I can go ahead and just double check the spacing and the spacing should be set to 16 on the right and then 16 on the left of this row. So it's 32 essentially. So if I move this over, it's already set to 16. So I just need to make sure it's set to 16 once more. And now that's third, that makes up 32. So that's fantastic. Um, and then I could go ahead and just set that to 16 again. Whoops, I could actually just connect these two and that's 32 once more. But we're gonna go ahead and define these headers. So I'm gonna select header A. Now we have header A and then I'm gonna duplicate header A and just change that to header B. You can start to see what this exercise is. I challenge you to take this on by yourself. You know where this is going. Um, and then we got header C. And then we got our last header, which is header D. So now header D specified. What we can now specify is the padding on the right here set to 16. Um, so if I grab my ruler, uh, you'll see that currently it's specified to 56, the parent container. And the these, these headers here are set to 52 currently, but they're all centered, so it's as if they are positioned properly. But what we could do is increase that that height of this of these headers. Actually, we can't because they have auto layout applied. But we're in this case, we should be oh, we're good to go. Um, we could modify the height of this element to uh, the parent the parent element so that it's set to 56, which we could do right now. So here we have this header and we what we could do is just remove that auto layout and make sure that we set this to 56 and then re-add auto layout and we're good to go. So I use shortcut keys in that scenario, but now if we go ahead and select our elements, you'll notice that all of the heights, the height of these elements are set to uh, 56. And I'm just gonna click reset instance real quick, just to double check. And now all of these elements fit properly within the header. So now that we've justified that, we need to just readjust the spacing of this, of, of this element. So the padding set to 16 here. And I just need to move it over four more pixels. Now it's set to 17, we're almost there. Whoops, I actually have one more pixel to go. So if I select that parent, move it over one pixel, we should be golden, all right. If I hold down, okay, now we're good to go. We have that, that first header row built out. And the awesome thing about the construction of this component is that we can wrap this, we can wrap this into an entire row of auto layout, and we'll, I'll showcase to you the power of auto layout now. So with these cells selected, if I hit Shift A, Shift A, and what we want to do is remove, remove that, remove those constraints there. Uh, Shift A, and then it it'll change the alignment. So just realign it. So if I click on this, hit Shift A it has now 
uh, added that extra spacing, which is thrown off this component uh, by one. It pushes it up one pixel and then moves it over to the left one pixel, if, if you notice. So it, it's kind of a repetitive process, but um, we can just keep realigning these elements once we've added auto layout and just keep doing that. And with that, so here we go. So auto layout, and then I'm gonna hit zero, zero. And then I'm gonna push this down one, push this over to the right one. And now what I'm gonna do is select all these auto layouts and hit shift A. And now what I've done essentially is, what, it, what this has done is now applied spacing amongst all the elements in an equivalent, equi proportionately, excuse me. So there's now four dips of spacing between all the elements and I could even remove that spacing so it's maintained. So that's what I want. And the awesome thing about this is if I select one of the, the, the rows here, one of the headers, so to the one of the columns, I can move it around. Uh, if you, for those of you who can see that. So if I actually change the color of this to make it more visible, see that? It's as, as simple as moving your arrow keys around now. So this, you start to see how powerful auto layout is within very complex components such as data tables. So now that we've done that, um, I'm gonna show you something really awesome now. I'm gonna undo all those actions to restore that color. So if I grab this row and I duplicate that row, I'm gonna label this row two and just whatever, row two. You know, I got row two now, this is awesome. I need the checkbox, but I need to use the number cell and I need to use the text cell. But the great thing about this is we can select that instance, right, in our second row, and we could, we could go to our, our swap instance and select, we could select that text variant it's now swapped it with the text variant, which is so convenient. And it's now, with this swapping, all we have to do is go to the instance in our layers panel and then select our swap instance here, drop down menu, and then select that variant in that group, in that category. And I can just keep selecting text. And I can do the same exact thing for both these elements at the same time. I just select text. And what you're going to need to do is uh, ensure that you have the uh, proper spacing uh, justified here. So this might need to be set to say uh, eight or actually we might need to, yeah, we actually should remove that. So it shouldn't, the parent auto layout frame should not be set to eight. So there we go. Um, you start to see the power of auto layout, but in certain scenarios, the alignment's difficult when it comes to doing it within rows because all of your cells kind of have to be hugging each other. So for the for that scenario, it's kind of showcasing you how you, the power of swapping and utilizing auto layout. But as you can see, since our, our cells are specified slightly different in certain scenarios, we can't align that uh, vertically properly. So we're going to Go ahead and just not use auto layout for the following. Okay, so now what we can do for our second row is I'm gonna remove auto layout. All right, so now I've removed auto layout and they're all just cells. And I want to maintain the spacing here all I have to do is go ahead and swap my instance, right? So if I, I could select all these and go to header and select text. Now I have all my text variants. Everything is aligned properly by default, which is awesome. Um, and I'm just centering this now. Uh, so that is great. And we should be good to go. We now have our second row. I'm just gonna label this cell A1 and then cell B1, I'm gonna copy that, and cell C1, I'm gonna copy that again, cell D1. Okay, and you'll notice that these all align vertically in, in the column format there. 
which is perfect. This is what we want to achieve here. And we can go ahead and just continue to duplicate these rows here. And with that alignment, we got row three. I'm gonna hit Command D, we got row four. And now we got row five. And that is amazing. We are good to go. And you can see that if we put this on a white background, we can see the outlines we made. And all we have to do is add dividers. I'll show you exactly how to do that. Let's just go ahead and put this on a frame, the background here. And here you can see the the table here, but it's missing these dividers. So we already have this divider component made. All we have to do is go to our assets, grab divider, grab a divider. And with that divider, since it's so thin, you may just wanna drag it into your data table by default. And then if you hold option V, option H, it will automatically center it vertically and horizontally within your parent container. So we have it in there. But what we're gonna to wanna to do is first justify the width of this element of our container, which is set to 529. Now I have now 529 set, I'm gonna hit option A, snaps it to the left. And I'm actually going to shrink it one pixel so that way the color is um, not overlapping. Currently it was overlapping, so you could see a little weird uh, intricate -ish detail there. And then I could decrease it on the right as well. And what we're gonna do is uh, make sure this is set to surfaces surface overlay. Now that we have that specified, I'm gonna click on this divider and drag it into the row one header. So I'm just gonna drag it and now lives there. I'm gonna set it at the bottom and I'm gonna hit option S. It now snaps it to the bottom of that row, which is exactly what we're trying to achieve. So if I click on this divider in my layers panel, I could go into, this is awesome, watch. I'm gonna, here, click row two, shift click all the way down to row four, hit enter, and hit command V. Uh, that actually didn't do what I was expecting it to, so that was a major fail, lol. What we're gonna do is individually select each row, hit paste, and since you pasted that previously into the last row, it will recognize that and snap it to the bottom of, your, of the row. Since it has those same properties, it, it recognizes it as, as such and pastes it in that in place. And we've now created our data table, which is awesome. We've created our material design data table with checkboxes. So we made the most complex variant in this interactive demo on material design's website. And it's easy to go ahead and just create the default one, right? All we have to do for the default one is say I duplicate this, I'm gonna rename this default. Only reason I'm calling this default, there's not clear justification on this yet, is that this is the default variant specified in the demo. So what I, now, all I have to do is uh, go into each, each, each row individually and delete the checkbox. And the nice thing about check the rows with auto layout implemented is that it will auto recognize, it'll recognize that automatically and then accommodate for that spacing and remove it and resize things as needed, which is awesome. Um, and again, I'm just going in command clicking, grabbing the checkbox and moving it, uh, deleting it. And now what we can do is in the layers panel, I can hit command A and start moving all those elements over so they align appropriately. And then I can select this row, whoops, select this row and ensure that I'm not selecting the divider and then start moving this content over. And it's the same drill for the rest of these. Uh, just, just keep moving that content over. And I like to organize my layers panel to reflect the layer order of, of what, how this would potentially be composed in development. So I move the divider all the way down. And then I'm gonna go ahead and select the rest of those cells here in the second row and move this divider down. And we have our default uh, uh, checkbox there. We have our default variant that we specified, right? And there's a little bit of spacing on the right there. And we could, of course, uh, remove that and ensure there's a padding of of uh, of uh, eight there on the left. 
or 24 from the cell itself um, as needed. And you can go ahead and specify that yourself if you want. And that is how you create data tables in Figma and for material design. I really hope you learn a lot, kind of mixing and matching auto layout with this. Um, I, I enjoyed making this video with you. I hope you enjoy this and I will catch you in the next one.